hope everybody enjoyed their lunch and welcome back uh, to those of you who are following us online. Um, we appreciate you staying with us for our, the last panel, which I think is actually the most important panel. Um, when you think about the discussion of the alliance and regional <laughs> relations, which has animated sort of the topics for this year's uh, strategic forum, because in many ways, supply chain security, economic resilience, however you choose to describe it, <clears throat> um, figures broadly in every country's outlook, not just in regional relations in terms of economics, but also in terms of strategy, security, and politics, um, uh, because uh, the world has become much more uncertain with uh, things like the war in Europe and China's increasing weaponization of economic interdependence. So in many ways, this is, uh, I think, our, our most important panel of the day uh, because it really informs outcomes on the previous two panels that we were talking about. And so I'm very happy <coughs> that um, such a distinguished and expert group of scholars and experts um, and practitioners could join us uh, for this discussion this afternoon um, on economic security and Korea's trade agenda. Um, so I'll briefly introduce them to you. Their bios are in the program and on the website. Um, to my immediate left is Robert Atkinson, uh, who's president of Information Technology in and Innovation Foundation. I was just joking at our, our lunch table that uh, Rob is CSIS's favorite expert on economic resilience and supply chain security. We've participated in a number of panels um, involving Korea, Australia, and others on, the, on this topic. And so he's one of the go-to experts with regard to these issues and a thought leader on them in Washington, D.C. Um, sitting next to, uh, to Rob is uh, Ambassador Seok Young Choi, Che, who is currently senior advisor at Lee and Co., um, former uh, South Korean ambassador for economy and trade, uh, former ambassador to the United Nations and the WTO uh, in Geneva. We're also happy to welcome him back to CSIS. Um, <clears throat> again, one of our uh, experts and most sought after uh, folks. He's also had the, uh, the, priv the, the pleasure, we hope, of being uh, on our Capital Cable show as well. Um, um, <clears throat> and sitting next to him, amb the ambassador is Dr. Hyo Young Lee, who is a assistant professor at the Korea National Diplomatic Academy, KNDA, um, teaching and writing on issues regarding international trade law, policy, and diplomacy. Before joining KNDA in 2017, Dr. Lee worked as a research fellow at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, or KIEP. Uh, prior to that, uh, Dr. Lee was assistant secretary for trade, industry, and energy in the President's Office and Deputy Director at the Ministry of Public Affairs and Security. Uh, and then uh, batting cleanup, to use the baseball analogy, is Clara Gillespie. Um, she is an advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research and serves as the official U.S. Delegate to the Energy Research Institute Network and East Asia Summit linked network whose inputs are designed to inform the formal EAS, East Asia Summit, or EAS process. Um, prior to that, she served as Senior Director for Trade, Economics, and Energy Affairs at NBR. She also has uh, Korea chops, if you will. She was a visiting international fellow at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, Yep, I don't know if you two overlapped. Um, and also a visiting fellow at the Taiwan Foundation for uh, Democracy. So it's really a great and uh, um, a very diverse group in terms of their experience and expertise, and I look forward to the conversation uh, with all of you. Um, so I thought I would start with um, a very, uh, start very broadly um, with, in our first round of questions uh, to get us um, our feet wet on the topic and here I'd love to get your assessment uh, of um, each of your government's commitments to the whole concept of economic security from both a U.S. and a South Korean perspective. 
Um, to what extent have the United States and Korea internalized critical supply chain resilience into their, um, not just their economic policies, but also their foreign policy? Um, we talked a little bit about this on the first panel, but to what extent has the private sector internalized this? And more generally, what is the public's understanding of these questions about economic resilience and supply chain security? Now, of course, you can talk about this in your specific areas of expertise because um, I'm not expecting you to talk about them in all areas of expertise, but in your particular areas of expertise. So uh, perhaps we can start with Rob, if you'd like to offer some thoughts on this first round of questions. Sure. Thank you, Victor. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, this is one of those issues, I think, where it says the glass half empty or half full. Uh, I tend to live my life being glass half empty, so I'm constantly depressed. Um, <laughs> so the, the short answer is, compared to where we were three or four years ago, the U.S. is taking a lot more, uh, putting a lot more attention into supply chain issues. You've seen the Biden administration with multiple supply chain reports. Um, the, the, uh, a lot of talk about making sure that there's supply chain resiliency. Uh, they're also supporting the bipartisan and hopefully bicameral competitive legislation that now is being in conference committee in the House and the Senate. And among other things, that one of the things that bill would do would be to create a, a CHIPS Act, which is a, essentially a $50 billion semiconductor fund initiative with probably 40 of that going to just incentives for uh, allied country companies or U.S. companies to build semiconductor facilities in the U.S. So Samsung, SK Hynix would qualify, just to use an example, and then also R&D. But I do think um, we're, we're, there's no, we're not doing anywhere near enough. First of all, we haven't passed that legislation, uh, which should have passed it last year. Um, secondly, that legislation, even if it's useful, sorry, even as it's useful, will not be enough. Uh, the U.S., uh, I would argue, suffers serious challenges. I mean, one of the things you have to have if you want to think about this, and I would argue countries should think about this, not just from a defensive perspective, which is sort of the way people are encouraged to think about it now. We, we have to have supply chain resiliency in case something bad happens. We do, <clears throat> but we also have to have supply chain resiliency to use as a weapon. <clears throat> Um, and I would only use the weapon in self-defense, to be clear. I'm not advocating we use that weapon. But there are cases where we have to use the weapon against uh, a very large country in Asia, um, who uh, will go unnamed, shall we say. Um, that country uses that weapon constantly. And I'll give you one example of where the Trump administration used the weapon, and it was just a wonderful thing to see. I think, as you all know, the Chinese have put 150 billion, 130 billion into just pure subsidies for their semiconductor companies. Total violation of the World Trade Organization agreement. They get away with it. And on top of that, they use stolen or forced intellectual property theft and tech transfer. So they had this company called Fujian Hinghua, which I'll pronounce it not quite right, probably. And uh, they wrote them a check, and they were said, go out and build DRAMs, which is what the two main Korean companies build, the uh, dynamic random access memory chips. Uh, and on top of that, the technology they were using was stolen from a Taiwanese company that was partnering with Micron, which is a U.S., the third major uh, memory maker in the world. Completely illegitimate company. Uh, it shouldn't exist because it had stolen IP and massive subsidies. Not, we're not talking little subsidies, which everybody does. These are outrageous subsidies. So what the Trump administration did is they essentially said that uh, U.S. technology that makes semiconductors could not be exported to that company, and they just took it away, and that company went bankrupt. Uh, I think that's a really great thing. I, again, I don't advocate doing that unless there's a real reason to do it. But the main thing I think we need to do, and I'll stop here, is I think we have to, just in terms of defense, for example, we know what our defense capabilities are. Korea and Japan know what your defense capabilities are. We need to work together to understand our supply chain capabilities. And we're not really doing that. If we wanted to, if we, we, we were forced to take some action against China because they've taken aggressive action first, what do we do? What's the best, most effective tool or weapon?
And we haven't done that, certainly we haven't done that in the U.S., to my knowledge, and we certainly haven't done it as a group. So I would argue we collectively need to work to gain that uh, economic uh, and industrial intelligence, if you will. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, Ambassador Chair, yeah. your views on this? Right. Um, Korea has experienced um, supply chain disruptions in many cases beforehand, um, starting from uh, the thought retaliation of China uh, when Korea deployed a uh, thought system in the Korean Peninsula. Um, actually, the damage was widespread. Actually, we have checked actually the actions taken by China, and we found that actually uh, uh, several different types of um, um, sanctions uh, uh, exercised by China to the Korean companies. For example, uh, delay of the customs clearance and actually uh, the popular boycotts and export control and import, actually, import, import control, etc., etc. And, and also uh, the tourist, um, the mass tourist uh, from, from China was uh, also uh, uh, controlled by Chinese authorities. Um, and also, uh, we had experienced um, the Japanese export control for three uh, critical materials in produ producing semiconductors. Um, and uh, on top of that, uh, we also uh, have experienced uh, supply chain uh, disruptions because of uh, aggravating U.S.-China uh, strategic competitions. Uh, United States uh, strengthened uh, export control regimes, and the United States also strengthened uh, foreign direct investment reviews, uh, particularly targeting uh, Chinese investors. Because uh, the supply chains are interlinked, because Korean components are exported to China and then reprocessed and then re-exported to the United States. Therefore, U.S. Uh, uh, export control against China affecting Korea's exportations automatically. Uh, actually, the world is uh, interlink interlinked. And uh, under uh, Moon administration, um, uh, facing uh, with uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, thought retaliation, as the Moon administration's response was uh, just a peacement policy towards China. They did not take any actions, uh, although there, are, there were apparent uh, discrimination against the Korean companies, then even uh, Moon administration did not file the case to the WTO, uh, although it was apparent a violation of the Chinese obligation in the WTO system. And regarding uh, Japanese uh, export control against uh, actually Korea at that time, uh, Moon administration did not uh, try to address the root cause of the problem. That is uh, actually history issues, uh, bilateral disputes. But uh, uh, instead of that, uh, Moon administration would like to be uh, technologically independent, actually. Uh, I, I think that is not the right way, actually, to address the problems. And the U.S.-China uh, strategic competition is not actually temporary issues. It will be continued for several decades in the future. Therefore, I think the uh, um, Yun administration had the great lessons learned from previous administration, and also they, they clearly recognized the changing environment. Therefore, they uh, actually uh, Economic security issues has become one of the priority policy agenda uh, in, in UN administration. They just institutionalized how to respond, uh, actually, these economic security challenges. Therefore, as we heard this morning from presidential advisor Wang yun Zhong just mentioned, actually, they had a position in the presidential office, and also they had a position in prime minister's office they established the public-private uh, partnership committee in, in prime minister's office uh, uh, to address the, uh, the emerging uh, security issues. That is, the pandemic issues, climate change issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think that is a good move, and also UN administration uh, committed to uh, to work with the uh, United States, other uh, other partners in.
um, and the formation of IPEF uh, in the Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, although the IPEF is in the making process, it is an evolving process. Uh, actually, we still don't know the final product of this, uh, uh, this exercise. The form and contents are still in the air, but I think there is a good direction for Korea uh, as a founding member to work together with the United States. Actually, um, that is quite clear. Korean uh, new administration is very clear on that, uh, that policy objectives. And uh, actually, the other issues, um, the private sector's response. Private sector has a kind of a mixed feeling uh, in the changing environment because um, they had a great deal of investment in certain country, like uh, in China. And they just would like to know how this uh, strategic confrontation between US and China would be unfolding in the future and how economic security policy would affect their business activities. Um, they have a great deal of uh, concerns uh, on uncertainties and unpredictabilities in the future. And also they, um, they uh, actually individual uh, business uh, are also working together with associations that actually first they just would like to map out uh, the vulnerabilities. Um, kind of bottlenecks of supply chains. And then uh, the best way for business people uh, would be uh, the diversifications. They, just, uh, they are just uh, uh, actually hedging the risks, uh, risk hedging or risk prevention. But they are still concerned what kind of uh, governmental policy directions uh, would affect their future business activities. I have to stop here. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Lee. Yes, uh, let me first point out that there seems to be two dimensions in uh, the economic security issue, uh, internal and external. Uh, internal dimension of economic security, I think, is industrial policy, mm -hmm. because securing uh, competitiveness in terms of industry uh, sectors is critical to the economic security and national security of a country. And the external dimension, I think, is supply chain resiliency because uh, the stable supply of, uh, of critical inputs for manufacturing is ultimately also important to uh, maintaining and securing uh, economic security as well. But coming back Actually, to your question. You, could you move the mic a little closer oh, okay. to it's, you so that we can sorry. hear a little better? So, uh, and coming back to your question on whether Korean government is committed to economic security, uh, I think that the government's official announcement of becoming a member of the IPEF as an initial member is actually a strong commitment of the UN administration uh, to secure the ex this external dimension of supply chain together with the IPEF member countries. And the extent to which Korea has been able to internalize uh, support chain resilience into its policy, I think it remains to be seen as the details of the IPEF will come along. Uh, but I, for Korea actually has been very sensitive to supply chain uh, issues as uh, Ambassador Che has mentioned. And I think that uh, it began in 2019 when Japan imposed uh, export controls on critical inputs for semiconductor manufacturing. And, and the latest supply chain shock uh, was actually last year when there was a shortage of urea, which is a critical input for manufacturing cars in Korea. And actually, these two types of incidents have different uh, factors involved. The first, uh, actually the latter incident uh, involving urea is more of a supply chain problem caused by natural factors or structural factors, uh, meaning uh, they were pandemic-induced uh, supply chain disruptions. On the other hand, the former incident involving the semiconductor inputs is more of a geopolitical factor and caused by the, um, the, the, the strategic uh, relations between Korea and Japan. And so uh, in the aftermath of these supply chain shocks, Korean government has actually involved, uh, in, has been uh, engaged in diverse ways to, to, to strengthen its supply chain. Uh, 
uh, many countries, as, as did many countries, involving uh, stockpiling and diversification and friendshoring, and also trying to strengthen its domestic capacity to replace the imported inputs. But unfortunately, I don't think these policies were sufficient for future, for dealing with future um, supply chain shocks uh, that are more strategic in nature, like the case of the semiconductor import inputs. And uh, therefore, I think that it is very important for IPF um, because it can serve as a mechanism to induce members to coordinate their supply chain policies and uh, export restriction policies uh, so that our supply chains can be made more resilient in a collective manner. And with regard to the private sector, uh, I think that the Korean government's quick move to join the IPEF and the president's emphasis over numerous times on the importance of economic security is, sends a very strong signal to the business sector and to the public as well that uh, the government is committed to economic security and that for the businesses in making their investment decisions, which were previously based on commercial, con commercial considerations, that sh they should be actually in coordination with the government's initiative to put emphasis on national and economic security. And so I think that for Korea, the success of IPEF is actually very important because it has now become a part of Kore the Korean government's economic security strategy. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Clara. Uh, so has the U.S. fully integrated this thinking about economic security or supply chain resilience into our policy making? I think I'd share Rob's sense that this is something that the United States is continuing to get better at, uh, particularly over the last couple of years, but sometimes not as quickly as we'd hope and certainly not as no uh, enough as we need. I focus on energy markets in particular, and one of the bright spots that you can see in the last 10 years has been the US's emergence as an energy superpower, uh, which has had implications for not just how we think about our energy security at home, but the ways that we've tried to engage with partners in the region uh, in creating uh, sustainable, reliable, uh, secure supply chains. And our relationship with South Korea in particular has absolutely been a motivating factor behind that. Uh, whether you think about natural gas markets and trade, uh, whether you're thinking about how to address market liberalizations, uh, other reform needs that can allow uh, greater investment in cleaner energy supplies, um, and then just you know, R&D and kind of government cooperation on a lot of advanced technologies as well, including uh, advanced nuclear. And there's a lot of positive momentum that we continue to see in those trend lines and the way that we're working together in the energy space. Um, but you know, something that was raised in, I think, one of the keynotes this morning uh, that really resonated with me is the idea of the pandemic serving as a wake-up call to how we think about our supply chain security. Because I think that's both absolutely true when we think about energy markets in particular, but also for that timeline I outlined, you know, this is not the first time we've had an alarm flashing red that should give us concern and pause about how we're thinking about our supply chain resilience in particular. Um, Ambassador Choi, for example, mentioned the Chinese restrictions of rare earth element exports to Japan. That was about 10 years ago now. Uh, we've seen some positive progress towards diversifying and kind of reducing dependence on China in particular, uh, but arguably more so from Japan, South Korea, and others than the United States leadership in this space. Um, you see other kind of potential bottlenecks or concerns, questions about China's positive and sometimes not so positive disruption of the solar market and strong dominance there. Uh, similar threads in new energy vehicles. Um, and then, you know, stepping aside from some of the geopolitical tensions, you do also have a, a lot of volatility in energy markets that for, you know, the outline we were given of energy, uh, economic security this morning have sometimes led to really painful high energy prices, uh, both for natural gas and oil. Um, but also have kind of at flips at times had supply crunches, uh, other challenges on firms when cra prices have crashed to kind of build up production or think about their diversification strategy. And already as you kind of look at this list, you see going into the uh, pandemic, 
a number of potential bottlenecks or pain points. Uh, that means that when we did see a number of the supply chain disruptions during the pandemic, um, they both were painful, but also in some cases not surprising. We had indicators for a while that we could be reaching this point. I think to their credit, the Biden-Harris administration has taken very seriously the idea that supply chain insecurity is a concern, and also the idea that our existing policies in this space have not been serving our interest effectively or well always. Um, Rob mentioned as well several reports that they've put out in the last uh, year and the last few months in particular, uh, including a very meaty one uh, looking at the Department of Energy uh, and some of the things that we might think about in terms of increasing our supply chain resilience there. I think there's a number of things that outlines that we could do, but we're still at the question of which of those tools will actually follow through and will do. Great, thanks. Um, if I could um, just go back to um, Clara and Dr. Lee. On, so Clara, on your point about energy security and um, South Korea, the summit clearly uh, pointed to one area, nuclear, yeah. as, as being an area for the Yun, Yun Biden um, uh, alliance going forward. Um, but in the past, there's always been a lot of talk about um, gas, mm. right? And um, what are, what's the potential, what are there legislate, what are the impediments and the potential for greater U.S. Korea cooperation on gas exports to uh, South Korea? And they're a big consumer of LNG, but shale gas, other, sort, other sorts yeah. of things. Are there legislative impediments? I know that this was something that was talked about quite a bit in the U.S.-Japan alliance in the past. That's a great question. And in terms of legal barriers, I'd argue that we've done a, a good amount to address them already. Uh, there were concerns kind of back 2014, 2015 of, um, you know, do you have to be a free trade agreement partner to be able to get U.S. LNG exports? We've kind of addressed that issue on multiple fronts. Um, the barriers I see now are a fewfold. Uh, one of them just has to do with some of what we're seeing in this supply crunch that we have at the moment, the question of how we're replacing Russian supplies, how quickly things can spool up. Um, so there are some things that we can do in terms of private sector dialogues on that question, some things that are going to genuinely just take time as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think another thing that we can do, and was hinted at this morning, and kind of key question for the market is, where does natural gas fit into this net zero future that we're talking about? The idea that if by 2050 we want to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions net on an economy level, methane emissions from natural gas are an important part of that story. Um, there are ways that you can address that through efficiency. There are ways that you can address that by new technology. And there are ways that we're not fully there yet. So the idea that the U.S. and Korea could cooperate on kind of moving forward some of these technology and policy questions, I think, could play a really positive role in natural gas. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And um, Dr. Lee and Ambassador Che, I mean, Dr. Lee, both of you raised the uh, two particular examples with regard to Korea, and that was urea last year, the urea supply shortage, and then also um, the um, um, the uh, uh, precursor materials for semiconductors, the so-called Japan whitelist. <clears throat> and I, I think Dr. Lee mentioned one of these was pandemic-induced and the other was based on geopolitical tensions that, as Ambassador Che said, worked their way eventually back to history issues, but then led to intelligence sharing issues and then, and then to uh, chip production. <clears throat> But I want to ask you, in, in both of these cases, both urea and the, um, uh, the precursor chip materials, I mean, it, there, are, there have been solutions, right? I mean, so let's start with the precursor chip materials. How did Korea respond to that? Um, um, Korea re responded to uh, Japanese export control measures uh, by kind of tit-for-tat actions. Korea uh, introduced the same, uh, actually, uh, export control regimes against, uh, against Japan. Uh, actually, Korea was excluded from whitelist in, in Japan's export control uh, list. Uh, 
exactly uh, Korea excluded Japan from uh, Korea's whitelist. And thereafter, uh, Korean government uh, invested a lot of money uh, actually to uh, develop uh, our own technologies or introduce new technologies from other countries. But at the end of the day, uh, the solution was made that a Japanese producer established a new investment in Korea to produce in Korea directly in order to avoid actually the trade fr frictions. But anyway, actually, we, uh, we could not develop our own technologies within two, three years' time. Yeah? Um, but uh, my, my, my problem uh, in, in this incident was that actually export control regimes are different from export restriction under the WTO system. Export controls are justified uh, uh, in case of national security concerns are existing. Therefore, uh, exporting country can restrict their export on the basis of um, their own suspicion uh, without any clear evidence. Yeah? Therefore, actually, we are talking about the trust among uh, trusted, trusted partners, but uh, between Korea and Japan, there is a zero trust, trust at all, no trust at all uh, in uh, having trade each other. That was the kind of biggest damage for Korea, actually, in, in uh, building uh, confidence uh, between the two friendly countries. Therefore, if, if we uh, improve uh, bilateral relations uh, between Korea and Japan, I think uh, the both countries should see uh, what would be the best way to remove, actually, the existing distrust, uh, which are still clearly exist existing at, at the moment. I think that is the, uh, the first way they have to move. Uh, Dr. L Dr. Lee? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I agree with Ambassador Che what he said about the difference between expert controls and expert restrictions. Uh, the semiconductor inputs uh, expert control by Japan uh, is more of a uh, national security issue and uh, a little bit different from the other supply chain disruptions that were caused by the uh, pandemic and supply chain disruptions. Uh, based on the structural uh, problems of supply chains. Uh, so it could be a different issue, but there are possibilities uh, that China might react with their own uh, export restrictions uh, based on their competitiveness in rare earths and other critical minerals. And I think that uh, we need some kind of collective uh, collective. Uh, method to deal with these types of economic coercion tools. And I think that one of the main tools of economic coercion that countries are using are export restrictions, actually. And uh, it's only an idea, but I, I, have, heard, I have heard that uh, the original pillars of IPF were not four, but six, and it included something about export controls or export restrictions. And I think that we need to think about having these types of restrictions on export restrictions, uh, again, in the IPF, because uh, in order to react against these uh, traditional tools of economic statecraft, like economic coercion using export restrictions, we actually need rules in place. And uh, so especially using export restrictions against trade partners, which are highly reliant on these types of critical inputs, I think we need rules to restrict ourselves from um, using those types of tools. Because in the end, if things go bad, even though we're allies, we might be tempted to use these expert restrictions based on economic security reasons. And uh, I think these individual country-based economic security policy goals and collective economic security goals may not coincide and we may need these types of rules to, to coordinate our export control policies or export restriction policies if necessary for the collective economic security of the region. Mm, right. Okay, so following from that, Rob, if, uh, so let's say these countries in IPF, they do this and they, they accept Dr. Lee's recommendation, they create re restrictions on export restrictions, uh, but there's one com country that's not in IPF, um, a big country in Asia that seems to be the reason we're talking about export restrictions. So what if we do all this and China continues to do what they do? Like, how do we deal with that? 
Well, there's two issues. There's the issue of China helping another country, which we see now with potentially with Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of one set of issues. How do we deal with that? And, and the way we deal with that, I think, is not a lot we can do about that. Um, you know, I suppose we could put a secondary restrictions, export controls on China to have them not do Russia. But when it comes, I think, to what you were talking about, which is when China is the economic aggressor, uh, and, and they've shown a clear history of picking off one country at a time. And <clears throat> then they go to that country and they have this giant stick and they start hitting them with the stick and the country says, wow, I don't want to get hit with the stick anymore. And, and, and maybe they make a deal, maybe they don't. I think at that point, IPEF members get together and say an attack against one is an attack against all and let's figure out what would be the most painful response we can give to this big country in Asia and just say, okay, you keep doing that and we're going to cut off this. Uh, because I think unless we do that, there's, there's no evidence that China is, is backing away from this, this, this aggressive, you know, it's, not, it's, it's like military aggression only, it's economic aggression. There's no evidence that they're not doing, that they're going to do that. I wrote a three-part series last year in a journal called the International, um, International Economy Journal. Mm. And um, it was basically, it was a fascinating, one of the great things I, I, as bad as the COVID pandemic was, it did let me read a lot. Um, and one of the books I read was uh, a book by um, oh, uh, a really good economist in 1944, why am I blanking on his name? But it was, uh, it was called uh, Economic Trade and Power Trade or something like that. Hirschman, Albert, Albert Hirschman, the famous economist. Yeah. It was the very first book that he wrote that hardly anybody's ever read. And what he said is there's three kinds of trade. There's free trade, which we're all familiar with. There's protectionism, which we're all familiar with. But he postulated a third kind, what he called power trade. And he basically said the Germans were practicing that from 1900 to 1944 or 45 when he wrote it. So it wasn't Nazis, per se. It was, that was the German approach, to use trade as a weapon to gain advantages in geopolitical uh, areas. And the argument I made in this three-part series of articles was that's exactly what China is doing. They weaponize trade to gain these advantages. And the only way to stop that to me is to do exactly what you're doing, what you're talking about, which is we've got to say collectively, no, if you attack one of us, it's an attack on all of us. So we were talking over lunch, as you remember, that. Um, Normally the conversation about China and weaponization of interdependence is what China can do to all of us. Um, but um, you, you know, trade is two-way, right? And so there are things that other countries trade with China that China values. Um, so I was, if I could go to our um, two friends from Korea, could you talk a little bit about sort of bilateral trade between Korea and China and things that are of value to China that, that Korea trades with China on a regular basis. Yeah. Right. Um, actually, uh, Korea's dependency uh, on China is huge. 30% um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of actually Korea's exportation to China account for more than 30% of Korea's total exportation to outside world, um, including Korea's export uh, through Hong Kong to China actually the figure will go up nearly 35, 34, 35%. It's a heavy dependency. Actually, that is a, a real uh, problem for Korea um, because um, our business people, uh, in Korea there is a saying actually, uh, we can work with the United States on, on security uh, areas while uh, uh, will uh, promote uh, economic relations with China because uh, we are so much dependent on China. That is uh, easy uh, but very wrong, uh, actually, policy directions. Because uh, as, as we uh, experienced uh, uh, in time of the third retaliations, actually China can exercise uh, economic coercive measures, actually, whenever they feel uh, unsatisfied. Uh, we, had, uh, we had more than uh, many experience, uh, not only for Korea, but, but also uh, Chinese uh, uh, economic coercive measures for the last 10 years. Uh, the cases are more than 10, 15 times, 15 cases uh, in the world. Yeah? Um, therefore, actually, uh, 
we have to be careful uh, in uh, discussing uh, supply chain resilience issues. We consider that actually China has a clear leverage uh, in exercising economic coercive measures. Number one uh, leverage is uh, China is uh, 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 capitalizing on their market size. And second leverage is uh, the, actually the data size. China is producing a lot of big data and then actually reprocessing the data. Uh, and then uh, actually, uh, uh, actually the stronger influence to outside the world. And lastly, um, the centrality of the governance. That is different from uh, Western world, actually. China is very much centralized, and state capitalism monitors and controls everything. Yeah? Um, but uh, outside world, uh, business people, uh, private sectors are divided. They are not that, that much centralized. Therefore, China can uh, exercise their centralized power uh, then actually it's very difficult to, to, uh, to handle the case uh, from uh, private sectors. Yeah. 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 Okay. If I may go back to your question on uh, China is not part of the IPF and what's the point of having restrictions on export restrictions when it's not going to apply to China. Yeah. Well, I think actually that the IPF is an exercise to make a rules template that is applied in the Indo-Pacific region, the Asia-Pacific region, and uh, I think start, uh, starting somewhere is very important where right now we have a multilateral system that's not working properly, and the rules that we have are not uh, working properly, and they're not uh, able to discipline China uh, as it was intended when we first made the multilateral trading system. And so we need to make new rules that are more relevant to the current uh, to reflect the current changing um, demands in the world uh, international economic order. And so we have to start somewhere. And I think that the IPF, if uh, we can get the right tools in place, can be a good starting point for providing this rules template, which provides disciplines that can apply to China. And uh, going, well, Regarding your question on China, um, I think that the fundamental question is how we can effectively deal with this China problem. And uh, we've seen that tariffs don't work, as I've read Mr. Atkinson's article on that China, tariffs are not effective tools to deal with China, as we've seen under the Trump administration's tariff escalation policy against China. Uh, so now we're trying to deal with China with rules and standards under the IPF as a starting point. And more specifically, we are trying to introduce uh, these higher level standards for labor and environment. Uh, and I think the aim is to secure this higher level, higher level playing field where China can no longer take advantage of based on their price competitiveness. And so, uh, so we're trying to have this new rules and standards that can apply to China. Uh, but there are many challenging issues, as we all know. Uh, first of all, because we have so many ASEAN members, as IPEF members, uh, we have to deal with two contradictory issues, I think. First of all, we need to uh, make sure that these rules are inclusive enough so that ASEAN members can also be part of this initiative. But at the same time, we have to make it binding enough so that the rules are effective. And so we have to deal with these contradictory issues, but both are very important to make the IPF possible. Uh, so um, I think that the issue here is how we can make these new rules and standards apply in a way that is effective enough and broad enough so that we can effectively uh, use these new rules to act against China if the time comes for us to act collectively. May, may, may yes, I add a please. point? Yeah, yeah. Actually, since uh, uh, the Madam Lee is talking about IPF more in details, um, actually, um, as I mentioned earlier, China is exercising unilaterally uh, their, their leverage is what they have. But the IPF is uh, just evolving. It's the, just the beginning stage. 
And uh, there are some uh, actually ambiguities uh, still unanswered by uh, IPF participating members and the future of IPF. Um, therefore, uh, I would like to see uh, more stronger leadership of the United States in the formation of IPF uh, in order to counter uh, the centralized governance actually uh, for, for, from, uh, from Chinese uh, side. Mm -hmm. Could, um, let me go to Clara. Clara, I mean, if, you could, if anything that's been said, you can address, but also on the question of rules and standards that I, IPEF is um, uh, hopefully designed to create. So uh, at the end of Dr. Lee's comment, she said that we should have these in case we need to use them with China. Mm -hmm. I, so the question to me there is like, what's the enforcement mechanism, right? I mean, how do we enforce that? And so, I, if, so, Claire, you can address anything that's been said, if that question, and also, Rob, if you can address the whole question of enforcement mechanisms, that would be great, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I found myself nodding along with everything that Dr. Lee said on kind of both the potential of IPEF and also the ways that we might think about fleshing it out and executing it. And I'd encourage, to your point on enforcement, one of the things that we should be doing alongside this is thinking about the institutions that are working well, too. So obviously, WTO and others do have some very specific challenges that need to be addressed, but they're not the only institutions that I think about where some of these um, economic security dialogues are occurring on. Uh, one, of course, you know, given my work with the East Asia Summit, that's a natural group. It also offers an opportunity for us to engage with China in roundabout ways too, bringing in them into the standards discussion. Uh, sometimes that's a little easier on the energy side, but there are pluses and minuses both. Uh, another one, I think we heard it come up a couple times this morning, was talking about APEC. APEC is a really powerful body that works on infrastructure, digital, and energy issues, um, and has a quite strong track record. It also has the added benefit of bringing in another potential partner that we haven't really talked about yet, which is Taiwan, uh, which is often otherwise difficult to bring into even the IPEF, uh, IPEF framework. It does have the limitation, though, that it doesn't have major economies such as India in it. So it is going to be something where, yes, there are different forms we can do, but we're going to have to have a blended approach of trying to bring in these multiple groupings. I guess a couple of things. One is, um, I think I think the administration has been too uh, ambitious. Maybe is the wrong term, but on IPEF, I, I think there's, I think they've succumbed to too many domestic policy interests, particularly from the left, to turn this into a sort of different kind of trade agreement that works on building up labor and environment standards and solving global climate change. I don't think any of that should be an IPEF. Me, IPEF is only about one thing, and that's how can these countries work together to expand and strengthen their own capabilities collectively of technology and, and, and advanced production, while at the same time building up tools to limit the damage that Chinese predation does. That's it. And I think IPEF I, I, I'm not critical of IPEF because it doesn't have, some people say, oh, it should have, you know, tariff reduction and all that. I, look, we're, our tariffs are already pretty low, and I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is can we really build it around that? And then, Victor, to your point, what happens if when push comes to shove and we're like, okay, now we've got to do something, and nobody does it, or I shouldn't say, and one country doesn't, doesn't do it, you kick them out. Uh, I mean, I just think we, it, it's got to be pretty clear. We're at that level of conflict, that level of battle, that we have to make a commitment that we're going to stick together. And if it turns out that the Chinese are doing something predatory or, or economically aggressive, um, we need to be able to, as a group, work together pretty quickly and in a consensus manner come up with something we all can agree with. But if some country is just, you know, recalcitrant and doesn't really want, they, they want all the benefits of IPEF, but they don't want to take any of the, take any of the hard steps, then I don't think they should be part of the agreement. So it seems to me like this, um, this whatever framework that, com that, is, that comes together um, will be tested at least once, right? I mean, it's got to be tested once mm 
for it to really have a deterrent effect on China, right? I mean, it sounds like part of what we're saying, and it came up in the sessions this morning, is that the whole notion, this whole conversation about decoupling from China, it sounds good, but in practice, it's very difficult to completely decouple from China. So the real conversation is about how do you deter China from acting in a predatory fashion? The, 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 as Rob said, you know, picking everybody off one by one, whether it's Philippines, you know, and, uh, and bananas, or you know, Norway and and uh, what was it? Norway and salmon, or wh whatever it was, you know, picking off one country at a time. That this sort of coming together in a sort of collective resilience format, but it seems to me like that's China's going to test that at least once yeah. to see if it really works. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it does, they may be more, they may think twice about using it against one of these countries, um, um, countries again. So I guess one question would be who, in, in particularly in some of these critical materials and technology areas, um, do you see this as something that is, I, you know, IPEF is largely a Asia, but do you see the scope of this group getting larger? I mean, who are the other partners for countries like the U.S. and Korea in some of the supply chain resilience um, in, in, in the sort of areas that you think are important? And we could just go down the line. Who, who are some of the other countries that are important to think about in terms of this? That, that we haven't talked about already? Well, I think the Brits, uh, the UK is clearly important. They, they've shown a willingness to stand their ground and, and to stand up and, and, and be counted. So I would clearly count on them. I would love to have Europe part of this. I just, just don't see it happening. I think the Europeans are not there yet in terms of growing a backbone to stand up to China. Uh, they're, they're sort of moving in that direction, but I just don't see them there. Um, the, you know, I don't know. After that, you go down the list pretty quickly. Um, I don't see Latin America being being willing to do much here, but I do think if you have the IPEF nations, including India, and you have the UK and Canada, uh, that's a pretty sizable group uh, from a GDP and, and output perspective that I think has a lot of clout. So that would be fine with me. Uh, in, in my view. Um, Actually, in Asia Pacific, um, actually the IPEP, IPEP uh, led by United States is now in the making process. At the same time, uh, there is also ongoing dialogue between uh, United States and European Union uh, on TTC, the Trade and Technology Council issues. Actually, broadly speaking, there are two emerging economic blocks, actually, both in Asia Pacific and then transatlantic settings. Um, actually, uh, responding to your question, actually, who would be the potential candidate for future IPEP, uh, IPEP system? I think this is just as you mentioned, the UK already uh, showed interest in, the, in participation of uh, Indo-Pacific uh, 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 dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly uh, the USMCA members like uh, uh, Canada and Mexico could also join. I think this, uh, the further extension, as uh, more extension of this IPEP members would not be possible because uh, the members, membership of IPEP uh, should have the same, should enjoy same value and same principles. Therefore, uh, the expansion would, uh, would be uh, fairly limited. Uh, uh, rather than uh, expansion, actually, they need to uh, concentrate on how to uh, integrate, actually, more efficiently uh, among themselves. Uh, I actually agree with what Ambassador Che has just said. I think we first need to uh, test whether the core countries of IPEF can work together to build supply chain resilience. And I think that the US, Korea, perhaps Australia, and Japan could first work together to develop a more science-based approach to deal with supply chain vulnerabilities. For example, um, Australia, I've heard they have an office called the Office of Supply Chain Resiliency, and they have developed this data database approach to identify the supply chain disruption risks. And so they have, a, they, they have identified the vulnerabilities and the, the criticalities and ultimately devising uh, targeted approaches or targeted responses to, to deal with the, res uh, in, uh, to the respective in, uh, criticalities and vulnerabilities in their supply chains. And I think that this method could be shared among the four core countries as a pilot test, for example. 
and that we, I, I believe that all countries actually have their own databases for analyzing supply chain vulnerabilities and that these data actually can be shared. Uh, but again, uh, because these may involve very sensitive information about the vulnerabilities of each country's supply chains, I think there should also be a guarantee, perhaps, to, uh, to ensure that these information are not used against themselves. So again, uh, go I'm going back to this issue about restrictions on export restrictions so that countries don't use export restrictions against each other. Uh, when they share these information, which is very sensitive. But I think that testing whether this kind of method will work would be a starting point before we go on to expand uh, IPEF to other countries. Perhaps as a second phase, we could expand this data sharing uh, experience with the ASEAN countries as a second phase, for example. Uh, well, it goes back to something earlier we talked about, which mm -hmm. is also trust, right? Mm -hmm. the, it's, it's hard to disentangle the, this concept of organizing around supply chain resiliency without, um, uh, without uh, a degree of trust. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, Clara, anything you wanted to add on the... Yeah, I think one of the areas where this gets really hard in practice is talking about critical minerals in particular, right. where China has such a dominant role in kind of lithium production, cobalt, uh, other rare earth elements. And if you kind of look at the projections for the next, I think it's two decades, the IEA says that demand for these critical minerals is going to increase something like sixfold. And so it's not just that we need to bring new supply and production online. It may also be that we need to do something structurally uh, different if we are really going to change that dependency relationship um, and think about a more diversified market. So in terms of the partners that can be helpful in that, um, I'd echo the sentiments of you know, pretty much everyone. We are going to need a lot of help in this question. Uh, ASEAN has an important role to play. India, I mentioned Taiwan, kind of looking outside the Asia Pacific. I think when you talk about uh, critical mineral demand as being driven by clean energy, that suggests at minimum there's a role for the European Union in thinking about efficiency, uh, other recycling, kind of ways to do this in a more sustainable, use more, less effectively. Um, and then also, just to throw another kind of big block out, uh, Africa. Africa is very, uh, different countries in Africa are very prominent in the mining space for a number of critical minerals. And so helping to create practices uh, that both support the emergence of new mines, but also to help make the case on why the US, South Korea, others are a good partner in that process. Uh, what's holding back investment into some of those projects relative to the way that China's investing. I think these are important conversations that we should be having. So on, on, that last, on that last point, um, I wanted to ask you, and I, we do have some questions from the online audience, but I wanted to ask you about industrial policy mm. sure. and the role that that, that plays in, in particularly this, in this critical minerals area. So. so look, the reason we don't have critical minerals is because of price predation. It's as simple as that. Nobody in their right mind is going to open up a critical mineral mine when they know they're going to be undercut systemically by the Chinese. This is what OPEC, why don't we have oil now in the US? Because OPEC intentionally underpriced, put them out of the market. Nobody wants to get back in the market again because they know they're gonna get underpriced again. So I think any kind of regime has to recognize that you just have to have some system in place against predatory pricing. And what I mean by predatory pricing is not like discounts and you know, hey, I wanna compete. That's fine, everybody does it. I'm talking about systemically lowering prices for a long period of time to drive out and keep out new entrants. And that's what China does. We, we, we don't have a critical mineral problem. There's lots of critical minerals all around the world. What we have is it's not economic to mine them. So I think we have to come up, we have to grasp that reality and, and, and that to me would be, that, that's a hard question to do, but I think we could. In terms of industrial policy, <clears throat> we have a report coming out this Wednesday uh, where what we've done is, and I don't think anybody's done it before, we've looked at seven key advanced industries, uh, computers and semiconductors, uh, electrical equipment, uh, automobiles, uh, motor vehicles, et cetera. So seven major industries. 
And we've looked at output in, in 10 countries, including Korea, Japan, China, India, Europe, US, Canada, Mexico, and Taiwan over a 25-year period. And what we find is really, really interesting. Number one is Korea is second highest in the world in terms of concentration of advanced industries as a share of your economy. So these advanced industries make up a bigger share of the Korean economy than only one other country, and that's Taiwan. So at one level, you're doing very, very well. The U.S., when you take out uh, in the information sector, so software, think about taking, take out Google, Microsoft, Facebook, then, and just look at more uh, atom-based industries. We are 80% of the global average in terms of the share of that as our economy. Korea is two times, 200%. So in Korea, those industries are twice as much as they are in the average globally. In the U.S., they're 80%. And, my, and that's gone down, just you can see that. And, and my argument is it, you can't, we, we simply won't be able to have a conversation about U.S. economic power in 25 years if these trends keep going the way they're going. Economic power to do what? Cut off, you can't come to Disney World anymore? That, that'll be a threat. Uh, economic power actually comes from making things. And uh, so, Victor, to your point, that's where we have to think about industrial policy. And industrial policy, as you all know, if you're in Korea or Japan, is not, we're not going to pick Intel over IBM or anything like that. We'll, we'll, we do say semiconductors are important. Storage and batteries are important. AI is important. Quantum computing is important. And so there was a set of policies we could have around technology and R&D support, around incentives, around better tax policy. We have the 32nd worst or least generous research and development tax credit now among the OECD and the BRICS. 32nd out of 34 nations. No wonder we're not increasing our R&D. So anyway, mm -hmm. we should do this. And, and you know, the good news is we appear to be on that path. That we're, there's more and more attention to that we have to do this. And the sort of you know, Adam Smith ideologues who say that you know, the government should just completely stay out of the way those people are being pushed to the side intellectually now, and there's much more of a kind of center-left, center-right discussion about why we need to do sensible things now. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think this uh, a mapping exercise uh, uh, to find out the vulnerabilities, um, and also the uh, monitoring exercise Actually, public-private partnership is very important uh, uh, in, this pro in, 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 in this process. And also the uh, cooperation with uh, uh, like-minded countries uh, with trust and pr principles, just as the IPEP uh, we just mentioned. And uh, lastly, one of the thorny uh, question is whether a country alone or uh, collectively can take a kind of anti-coercive actions. Um, that is uh, uh, another question we have to discuss, actually. We may not discuss, actually, details of, the, of that. For example, if we are really uh, challenged by a certain country or a certain group of countries uh, on supply chain disruptions, actually, what exactly we can uh, respond to that situation is uh, uh, actually uh, it's kind of a test ground of uh, collective uh, corporations. Uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, I think industrial policy is a, a policy that Korea has been pursuing since the beginning of the, uh, the 70s and 60s, I think. And so it's not a new issue for Korea, as Mr. Atkinson mentioned. Uh, but what I think is interesting is that only a few years ago, the US, Japan, and Europe have made a joint statement that they wanted to restrict industrial subsidies they wanted regulations in place so that uh, countries will not um, engage in uh, introducing industrial subsidies. But only a few years later, everything has changed. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's quite an irony here. <laughs> uh, but um, I think world, the world has changed. And we now live in a world where there has been a huge paradigm shift. And so I think we need um, a new kind of rules that do allow industrial subsidies, but in a way that does not uh, uh, allow a race to the bottom. So uh, though we need industrial subsidies, it is a legitimate public policy objective uh, 
but we also need rules that contain the level of uh, providing industrial subsidies at a level that promotes a race to the bottom. And I think that maintaining that balance, finding that right balance is the most important challenge here. And I hope that uh, the countries, uh, the, the, the major countries which are leading this initiative uh, also come up with good ways to, to find that right balance. Right. Uh, Clara, anything you'd want to add on industrial policy? Yeah, I think with critical minerals in particular, there's a lot that we need to do on industrial policy. I also think uh, the predatory pricing aspect of it is a really important and concerning feature. I think it also doesn't necessarily explain all the challenges we're seeing in the market right now, because with this kind of exponential demand, there's still the question of why isn't supply picking up as much as it could? Um, and pricing is part of that story, but there are also questions about local regulations, difficulty in land use, uh, kind of Byzantine bureaucracies, uh, both in Asia and the United States that are difficult for firms to navigate, especially smaller and new firms. So some of the things that we can be doing in that space involve improving regulatory environments, kind of streamlining these processes. Um, I'd actually encourage, and I'd love to get into this, uh, bringing back in some of the sustainability focus, because sometimes the barrier is not just that regulatory question, it's local improvement, it's concerns about the sustainability and negative environmental impact of the industry. The US, South Korea as well, actually have a really good case story on best practices and how to address that. Uh, bringing that to our other partners in Asia can help them as well with strengthening their own respective uh, mining and production sectors. Uh, and then probably about three more, but maybe I'll just stop with that for the moment. Okay, um, Okay. we have a few minutes left. Um, first, I have a question. I have some online questions, but I want to see if anybody in the room had a question before I went to the online question. Okay, um, so, so the question, one of the, I, this is not an easy question to answer in three minutes, but one of the questions we got is how should countries pivot in regards to critical industry, technology, f agriculture, energy, defense, and how, well, so this, we didn't really address this, but how can public-private partnerships play a role in this? So, so I guess we didn't really address the public public-private partnerships angle of it. Um, does anybody want to take a whack at that? Well, I mean, a couple things there. One is how you define critical industries is really important. And certainly in the U.S., agriculture is not a critical industry. Um, you know, we're never going to... we're. <laughs> We're never going to run out of food in the U.S. because we're so dominant, because we're so good. We've got so much. We've got advanced technology. We've got great land, sophisticated farmers. So I, I frankly just don't care about it. Uh, I, I think the risk to the U.S. is actually becoming a commodity trader. We don't want to be a commodity trader. We want to be a high-end trader. So that gets to this notion of, of uh, public-private partnerships. If you look at what most leading countries are doing besides the U.S., they don't just sort of have the government run these programs <clears throat> or they don't just have industry do it. It's usually some form of working together. Like the Germans, for example, have these Fraunhofer Institutes, 60 public-private research in, and development institutes. The government funds about 35, 40 percent. Industry funds the rest. Uh, to me, that's the model we should have. Uh, the, the advantage of that model is that you don't get, if, if it's not valuable to the private sector, they don't participate and you, don't, you, you reduce the risk of sort of political boondoggles. But at the same time, you have the government putting some skin in the game that gets strategic direction into the direction that's most important to the country. So I think lots of those things, uh, there are lots of different kinds of policies to encourage these uh, PPPs, but I think that's the direction, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree more, that's the direction we should go in. Knowledge, the international trade is not uh, actually uh, governed by international rule agreed, uh, rather than actually kind of managed trade is already popular uh, in the world, that therefore public-private partnership is very important because private se sectors uh, should also work uh, closely together with, uh, with the government. Otherwise, uh, they, have, uh, they have to be confronted with unexpected circumstances. I think this joint R&D uh, actually working, uh, private-public uh, partnership is uh, 
It's already traditional, actually, uh, collaborations. But uh, in the uh, field of uh, policy making, uh, it's a trade policy or economic policy, uh, also business, business policy making process, public-private partnership is very important. So I answered the quest first question. I think, how do you define critical industries? It uh, depends on the natural endowments of that country, I think. Sure. So all countries must uh, have different uh, must have different critical industries depending on their national competitiveness and where their national competitiveness comes from. And I think for Korea, I think it's technology because we have a very skillful manufacturing base and uh, technology is the area where we think we have our national competitiveness. So depending on that, our industrial mix and our manufacturing capacities are all different. And so I think that for the U.S., you have your own national competitiveness area. And for other countries like um, for Africa or other regions, they have their own areas where they can uh, maximize their national competitiveness. So it all depends, I think, on the different positions and um, the endowments that countries have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really agree with all of these comments. I'd say in addition to joint R&D, you know, there are also at times roles that we specifically want to reserve for the private sector and roles that we might reserve for government stakeholders. Uh, but having a space for public-private dialogue in particular can be really helpful to make sure that these groups aren't talking past each other, mm -hmm. uh, that we better understand if something's not happening on investment in this technology or in this geography, what's actually the barrier? Why have certain reforms worked or not worked, and how can we strengthen them? Thanks, and thanks for always being able to, even though I, you end up as the last person in the last two rounds, you've come up with really good things to say in addition to what everybody else here has said, which is terrific. So thanks, Clara, Dr. Lee, Ambassador Chair, Rob. Um, so um, this will con conclude the panel on supply chains. I just want to say that, I, again, I think of our three panels today, this is actually by far the most important because as I think Ambassador Chen, and Dr. Lee said, the world has changed. I mean, it has really changed and um, uh, uh, economic resilience uh, informs and influences every country's foreign policy today. And particularly in the case of Korea, when it comes to maintaining supply chain resilience uh, this dramatically affects its overall strategy towards China, towards the United States, and also towards Japan. So um, it's an extremely important um, and critical piece of the puzzle as the Yun and Biden administration go forward. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, our, our panelists for joining us today. Really an excellent, excellent discussion. Um, uh, so we've gone through three panels on the alliance on trilateralism and on supply chain resilience. Uh, I'm not going to even try to sum up all of this because I know that President Lee of the Korea Foundation will do an excellent job of <laughs> summing this all up in his, in his closing remarks. So uh, I invite the panelists to remain on stage and invite M uh, President Lee to the podium to make any closing comments that he would like. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Cha. Uh, how can I uh, sum up uh, all those excellent discussions if, if you cannot sum up? Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll try my best. I, I do think that uh, we have had a very productive uh, discussions and, and uh, sessions. Uh, being productive means uh, there are a lot of takeaways. Um, and uh, among those takeaways, uh, I would like to uh, emphasize uh, just three takeaways. Uh, we've discussed a lot about values, uh, we discussed a lot about tr trust, and we discussed a lot about economic coercion. But I would like to start with uh, the values, the importance of values. Uh, there are, I think, uh, we can imagine that there are two types of countries. Uh, one type is uh, calculating country, uh, calculating Korea, calculating Germany, calculating uh, America. And the other type is uh, believing country, 
believe in Korea, believe in America, believe in Germany. Uh, not that uh, Korea is religious uh, or the USA is religious, but those countries that believe in universal human values. So um, when we have those two kinds of two uh, types of countries, uh, which country would, uh, for example, China be uh, more afraid, or uh, which country uh, would China be more uh, feel uncomfortable? I would definitely say the countries that believe in universal human values. Uh, for those countries that calculate material interests, uh, it is quite easy to manipulate them. And it is quite easy to coerce them in a specific direction that a, a specific country wants them to move in. Uh, so uh, I do think that uh, the belief in universal values are extremely important, and those values are the backbones of liberal international order and the rules-based international order where uh, modern nation states get connected with each other and thrive together. Uh, the values are important, but uh, the firm belief in those values and resolution to defend those values is as important as the values per se. Um, out of belief emerge uh, trust, and we tend to trust uh, others if they believe in the same uh, values. For example, Christians tend to believe, uh, trust Christians, Buddhists tend to uh, trust Buddhists, uh, conservatives uh, trust other conservatives more. So uh, in order to have more trust, uh, we need to share uh, the same values. Uh, but uh, we cannot solely uh, rely upon uh, beliefs uh, like religious people. We cannot all be martyrs. Um, we have to be realistic, and in order to be realistic, as uh, we discussed uh, amply, uh, we need to come up with compensation mechanisms. And we need to come up with compensation mechanisms both within and without, so internationally as well as uh, internally. And secondly, there are two different, uh, two different kind of economic coercion. One is economic coercion, uh, uh, toward countries that violate universal values. I think this is what uh, Professor Chan mentioned when we discussed different types of alliances. Um, when we apply uh, economic coercion to those countries that violate uh, uh, universal human values, then we are talking about an uh, alliance for certain values. But there is another kind of ec economic coercion, and that is an economic coercion imposed upon the countries that are not loyal to a certain country, that, do not, uh, uh, that are not obedient to a certain country. And that is uh, the kind of economic coercion we should avoid and we should uh, defend against together as an alliance. Uh, so uh, the economic coalitions or IPAF, that those things that we discussed uh, today, I think those, uh, the, the alliances or coalitions that we discussed is uh, for uh, the universal human values. It's not really against China uh, or any other countries. We are not against a certain country, but we are against a country that violates universal human values. So that's the second takeaway. And finally, uh, the third takeaway is, again, uh, the importance of trust. Uh, we talked about collective resilience, which is coined by uh, Bonnie Glazer. And as we all know, uh, collective resilience is not possible without uh, trust. And like-minded countries are the countries that uh, believe in the same uh, universal human values. Uh, therefore, in order to avoid collective action problem, uh, we need to uh, be uh, like-minded countries believing in the same uh, universal values. So uh, I think I said this uh, last year in this same uh, strategic, strategic forum, uh, if you just follow material interest, uh, you never know where you're heading. Uh, perhaps uh, you might find yourself uh, uh, one day suddenly a slave of a certain country. But if you believe in universal values such as freedom, democracy, free trade, you know where you are going and where you're heading. So uh, I think uh, the universal values in uh, uh, universal values of human rights, freedom, uh, democracy, those are the backbones that we should abide by, and I think uh, Korea and the USA, we are like-minded countries because we believe in those, uh, the same values. I, again, uh, would like to extend my gratitude to, uh, to Victor Cha and the CSIS and the staff of CSIS, and also uh, the staff of the Korea Foundation uh, for uh, 
uh, organizing uh, this uh, very successful and meaningful forum. And as always, I reaffirm the importance of this uh, platform, which is called ROK US Strategic Forum, sponsored by CSIS and the Korea Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you.